Perfect. Okay, good. Okay, so my name is Maria Kodakova, and I'm currently finishing my PhD program uh, between the NMD team of NRIA and um, Mass Institute of Physics and Technology. And I'd like to thank the organizers for providing me an opportunity uh, to tell about how we did uh, redocking of the available co-crystal ligands of the main protease uh, for the benchmarking purposes for our software. Uh, so if we once again, after Stefan's presentation, take a look on the uh, coronavirus life cycle, we will see that after it releases the RNA uh, to the cell, um, here uh, two big polyproteins are translated uh, and to become fully functional, they should be cleaved into smaller uh, polypeptides uh, by the two proteases, by the main protease and papain-like protease. Uh, so if we somehow block one of these proteases, um, there will be not enough <laughs> functional proteins for the virus and it will uh, not replicate itself. Uh, and this makes the main protease a prominent target for drug discovery in this field. Uh, two more points on the main protease is that it's highly conservative and it does not have human homologs. Uh, so if we take a look at the co-crystal structure of the main protease, uh, we will see that there is uh, a region um, consisting of the catalytic diet of two residues, a cysteine here and a histidine here, uh, through which it cleaves the uh, peptide chain. Uh, so looking at the binding site uh, more closely, uh, here are these residues mapped on the protein surface. And here you can see a crystallized inhibitor. Uh, actually, since the binding site of the main protease is rather conserved, uh, it has been widely studied previously, and there are several um, subsites in it that are usually considered in drug design. Uh, what is also important is that the inhibitors of the main protease often bind uh, covalently uh, to the cysteine residue. Um, sometimes they also can bind non-covalently. Uh, from the computational point of view, if we try to do molecular docking uh, to find a new inhibitor, this means that for the covalent docking case, we need only to sample the conformation of a molecule that sticks to this point, if we know this point. And in this case, we have to sample the whole uh, rigid body and conformational space of the uh, ligand candidate. Uh, if we somehow try to dock a molecule that actually binds covalently in a non-covalent way, a problem may occur because many docking packages will think that there is a steric clash between the desired position of a ligand and the um, um, residue, uh, because a covalent bond length is <laughs> a steric clash if you don't know that it exists. Uh, so, therefore, we need to be careful when selecting the protocols for virtual screening of the protease inhibitors. Um, our motivation for uh, trying to uh, dock something to the main protease uh, consisted of the two parts. Uh, first of all, we ourselves wanted to do virtual screening of the possible main protease inhibitors, but to do that, uh, we first wanted to be sure that we have a protocol uh, that at least can produce um, neonative poses to the known ligands. And secondly, we also uh, had a collaboration with the uh, Yosha Benjos uh, project from Montreal, um, in which uh, their team um, aimed at a creation of a neural network that with active learning uh, would scan the chemical space of possible inhibitors of the main protease in a structure-based manner. And to train this neural network, they required um, methods that would uh, quickly generate uh, reliable uh, binding poses of the uh, potential ligands uh, in the binding pocket. Therefore, we also tried to search a protocol that could be suitable for this purpose. 
Um, so our team is developing uh, structure-based uh, methods and for the protein ligand interactions we have three scoring functions. Uh, the first one is called convex pale and it is a um, uh, knowledge based scoring function uh, that we train by classifying uh, native and non-native poses of ligands in the space of uh, geometrical and chemical features. Uh, so the resulting scoring function is pairwise and distance dependent and therefore it is very natural to map it uh, to some grids of uh, docking tool. Uh, so for example, we can map it to autodock liner and use not only to rescore some poses, but to uh, sample the poses. Um, so this integrated version is called liner CPL. Uh, we have also created a um, reworked version of convex PL uh, that is trained with um, a regression uh, to the binding constants to um, uh, do train the additional terms uh, for uh, entropic and salvation effects. Uh, it is also important to note here that although myself am developing scoring functions, uh, the binding free energy that we try to predict with a scoring function from a single protein ligand pose isn't very reliable. Um, because, um, well, to become reliable and rigorous, uh, we need to have an ensemble of confirmations um, for the protein ligand complex, but it is not fast. Uh, so our uh, latest scoring function is called CORPEL, and it is uh, derived in a classical statistical and supervised manner. Uh, what is important about CORPEL is that it does not require side chain positions um, for a protein ligand scoring. Uh, so we represent the backbone of each residue uh, with only an oriented frame and drop the side chains. And then we collect the statistics between the orientation and position of these oriented frames with respect to ligand atoms. Uh, so after all, we use these statistics to compute the uh, energy estimation. Uh, we supposed that in the case of uh, docking to the um, main protease, uh, CORPEL could be quite useful because since it does not require side chains, it cannot experience possible clashes if we try to dock a covalently bound ligand in a non-covalent way. Um, as for the data that we used for this benchmarking, uh, we, have, uh, we have taken um, 36 complexes uh, from the protein data bank. Uh, actually, there were even more complexes with covalent, covalently and non-covalently bound ligands, uh, but some of them came from the diamond experiment which was uh, fully automatic and in which they uh, crystallized small uh, ligand fragments to further use this information in drug design. And we I felt like uh, this is not very reliable data because it's fully automatic and because um, sometimes the small fragments with low affinity are crystallized in very random places of the protein. Uh, we have also uh, tried to predict the uh, binding affinities and took data from the two assays from the covid-pastera.ai uh, website. And you can actually see that uh, the common points in these two assays after dropping some bad cases, uh, well, they definitely correlate, but not uh, like one-to-one. -one. Um, now I'll proceed to our docking protocols. Um, first, we use StarGKit for confirmant generation of the ligands. Uh, then we use Autodoc Viner and our Viner CPL for pause sampling. And finally, we used our scoring functions to rescore the obtained poses. Uh, here, the W in parentheses near Corpel W uh, um, stands for uh, the version of Corpel uh, additionally weight for better um, affinity predictions. Uh, so our very first docking protocol was a very naive one. We just took the uh, ligands, regenerated them with Articate and tried to uh, dock uh, to the um, receptors. Uh, so 
it uh, overall resulted in rather higher MSDs. So you can see here that, for example, for autodoc wine and for a scoring of autodoc wine, um, it's a very bad, if I think, median MSD. And the best uh, protocol was the scoring of uh, Vinocipel, and we've got something less than three angstrom in the case of cross docking. Um, so, interestingly, if we would try to dock um, near native or sorry, alkyl crystal uh, ligand conformers with uh, the ideal geometries. Uh, we would get an improvement over all protocols, and it is quite uh, considerable. But in reality, we would not have uh, these geometries in the um, generated ligands case. Uh, after that, we tried to go for a covalent docking protocol. Uh, since we are using autodoc Weiner usually, we also tried to use it in the covalent docking case. Uh, here, for covalent docking, uh, ligand is considered to be a flexible side chain, and then instead of a ligand, we have a water molecule and they are sampled together. This is kind of a hack to make it um, dock covalently. The problem of this protocol is the fact that the outputted energies are lower than in the non covalent case, so they cannot be compared to the non covalent docking case. Um, so, with this protocol, we also um, achieved an improvement for uh, all the um, combinations of scoring and sampling tools. And, well, the bad thing here is that in this protocol, we already knew uh, where the covalent linking occurs, uh, where is the ligand attached to the protein. And in reality, in a possible virtual screening experiment, we wouldn't know uh, where this happens. Uh, so then we tried to think how can we uh, sample the possible places of the covalent uh, linkage. Uh, there are several mechanisms uh, of the covalent linking to the cysteine in particular. Uh, in the case of our 34 covalently bound ligands, only three of them uh, worked. So it is nickel addition, addition to an aldehyde and to a ketonide group. Uh, for each of them, we created a, a very simplistic pattern uh, in SMARTS and did the substructure search. Uh, and each match was a place to put a covalent link. Um, so as an example, uh, here uh, you can see the uh, 2D structures taken from the protein data bank annotations of our ligands. And for example, here, this is a correct link. Um, this double bond will go away and the um, cysteine will link to this carbon atom. And here, in the case with Michael addition, uh, this uh, unsaturated bond will also become a single one and the cysteine will link to this carbon. <coughs> so, unfortunately, uh, with this protocol, uh, with enumerating the links, we've got the worst term as this. Uh, compared to all the previous protocols we had. Uh, so this is only self-docking uh, and only 15 covalent ligands because uh, I didn't uh, go further um, and was disappointed with this protocol. Uh, so why did it work so bad? Um, probably one of the reasons and also consequences is that we had too many aldehyde groups and we put a link to each of the aldehyde groups and probably uh, in this uh, many links, the correct links were did not preferred. Um, another problem is um, a deeper one uh, because to attach the link, we need to have the um, prayer bound state of the ligand. Uh, we took them from the protein data bank, but in general, there is no convention on what state uh, should be annotated in the protein data bank. Uh, pre bound or the state that we see in the uh, crystallographic structure. So in some cases, probably we even did not um, reproduce the correct link because it wasn't existent in the structure annotation. Uh, after a kind of a failure with this protocol, uh, we decided to go for something non-covalent and more simplistic, and we just removed the side chain of the cysteine uh, so that the docking tools will, 
would not try to avoid this region, as you can see with the red docked pose here, to avoid a steric clash with this system. Um, so docking to a mix of the truncated receptors and full receptors, since we still had some non-covalently bound ligands, um, resulted in an improvement over all the uh, combinations um, of scoring functions and sampling methods that we had. Uh, actually, for Corpel uh, and Vinocipel, the improvement was not that sufficient, but for all other protocols, it was very sufficient, and it looks that uh, docking to these receptors is a stable idea. Uh, it allowed us to uh, obtain more uh, one angstrom uh, predictions that we had before, for example, like this. Um, so with this uh, link present, we wouldn't get the structure because the docking tool would think that this is a clash. And however, our median RMSD was still uh, less than two angstroms. And it turned out that somehow, uh, while we were generating the um, the um, uh, ligand conformers uh, from the existing co-crystal ligands, uh, we have lost the information on some stereoisomers and the stereoisomers generation became kind of random. So you can see here that uh, obviously we cannot um, reflect the uh, leftmost tail of the red predicted ligand uh, to the mirror plane with simple rotations so, so that it became neonative. Um, if we try to have uh, correct uh, isomers, uh, I think the prediction would be um, much better. Uh, we have also tried to enumerate all the possible stereoisomers, uh, like just forgetting all the information about them um, that we had. But it turned out that uh, the articates function that does it uh, sometimes finds a lot of possible chiral points and generates like a very big number of isomers for each ligand. So finally, uh, we tried to predict affinities. Uh, in this case, we used the best protocol from the previous slide with the mix of truncated and full receptors. Uh, and we even used the full enumerations of stereoisomers uh, because there were a smaller amount of them per molecule. But in the result, for all combinations of our docking tools and scoring functions, we've got near zero correlations uh, for both affinity datasets. Um, probably this happened uh, because affinity prediction in the case of ligands that are partially covalently bound and partially not is not very reliable. So uh, overall, uh, we have uh, developed a protocol that finally could achieve um, in a stable way, uh, more or less neonative binding poses that was based on two simplistic things. So. The first one is using truncated receptors not to have clashes in docking. And the second thing was that we used CORPL that is sidechain free, and thus it is quite good for uh, scoring uh, cases where we don't know whether the ligand could bind covalently or not covalently. Um, what can be done is that we definitely need a better method to uh, explore the covalent links if we're going for a covalent docking protocol and we still have uh, poor affinity predictions. Uh, so this is an ongoing project. Uh, so we're still working on improvement of our protocols. Um, for example, we could also better cluster receptors uh, before docking and maybe use some template-based docking since the binding pocket is known. Um, finally, I would also ask um, maybe for advice um, um, ask the audience, uh, maybe you know something about how are the covalent links uh, found in the virtual screening experiments when they have a lot of molecules but know that they should bind covalently. And probably this is also a question to Laura and Yesemen. Uh, probably we could 
could um, give me an advice on how to efficiently sample the stereoisomers because uh, we're using Cardiac Heat, but I don't know whether it's a best solution. So thank you for the attention. Uh, here is my email, so maybe you could answer <laughs> these questions and write me. Okay, thank you very much for the talk. <coughs> so do we have questions? <coughs> Switch your mic on. <clears throat> so maybe one, one comment or one question about the binding affinity prediction. Of course, <clears throat> as you pointed out, this is a very difficult question. On the other hand, you, you had at some point in a, a slide where you were saying that this was possible in certain cases. So uh, could, could you be a bit more specific on which cases uh, can be tackled and uh, why, you're, why you're not in one of these? Um, you mean which slide of mine? When you were optimizing the terms of uh, CORPL, this uh, ratio of logs. Uh, uh, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Oops. You, you, you passed it. Yeah. You, have been too, you have been too fast. Yeah. This one. Nine. Slide nine, I guess. <clears throat> uh, this no? one. Yeah, this one. Uh, yes, this one. Um, well, Actually, I don't think that I was saying this on this slide, but I really mentioned affinity prediction on the previous slide, on this one, uh, when saying uh, about the fact that we need yes, a full yeah. ensemble to, to generate something that we can trust. Yeah, uh, so in the case if uh, the molecule is not very big and uh, the um, entropic effects are not too big, um, so for relatively small molecules, current functions um, probably would work uh, more reliably. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is a question of entropy. Okay, thank you. <coughs> so do we have more questions? <coughs> Uh, David, is it very different from the coarse grainings potentials? Mm. Um, so it is. Uh, so if compared with coarse grained potentials, the problem uh, of the protein ligand coarse grained potentials is that it is hard to coarse grain a ligand. Although it was recently done by Martini, they um, did coarse graining for some ligands. And in our case, we keep the ligand uh, full atom and use coarse graining only for the receptor. Um, so, well, as for the receptor, it is not very different from the coarse grained potential. But in the particular case of protein ligand scoring functions, um, previously, um, coarse graining of the receptor wasn't um, tried by the community. <coughs> 